Welcome everyone to Libraries and Response session 112. Uh, we are underway here and uh, we're going through our introduction here. Uh, this is a, a, a quote from our speaker day, Patrick Sweeney. There are many ways libraries can be better prepared to face this uncertain future, changes in government. We did have presidential election, but this is international, at least in part. And so uh, some changes in government is, is to be expected. And this can change the outlook for, well, for every institution. Uh, discussion will focus on how to take advantage uh, of the next four years in the U.S., of course, uh, uh, to advocate for libraries. This is what we all need to be thinking about is the next four years here. Our contribution to this, that is to say gigabit libraries, is uh, an advocacy that is encapsulated by this phrase, this incomplete phrase, libraries are. It's a definitive, incomplete statement. So uh, in reaction to that, we asked some of our prior speakers to comment. I mean, and so these, these have come back to us. Uh, our, this is a, a great one, Cal, Cal Culliger, he's the, uh, the cartoonist for The Economist. I'm going to give a plug to Cal's book here because Cal was so nice to uh, come on for us. And and this is this is Cal here, <laughs> and this is all these are all the powerful people of the world. Uh, and uh, Cal's contributions: uh, libraries are islands of truth in a typhoon of disinformation. He just spun that up on the spot as we were talking, as he was presenting. So good. We've got you know these other notable people. These are all non-librarians, which is our point. Is trying to advocate for a library to draw in people who are notable and uh, respected to weigh in. And, you know, and then, so these are, these are all usable. Of course, we have a, a full document with their full quotes, but these are all usable by anyone who would like to, you know, leverage the, the, the support of these distinguished people. Our, this is how it got started. Our last uh, recent speaker, the former chair of the FCC under Bill Clinton, uh, where E-Rate, the subsidy program for libraries and schools in the U.S. Uh, for communications, uh, offered this, this one. Libraries are multi-service public facilities, dispensers, et cetera. Totally wonderful. Give them more money. Ask them to do more. And this is totally the way to go. He was, he was pretty energetic about it. That's what triggered this idea of libraries are. And so we have kind of responded to that as well. And we've thought about this metaphor of libraries as a Swiss army knife of public institutions. They do more things for more people than any other institution by far. But what exactly is the kind of scope of that? Uh, this is maybe a normal small library kind of metaphor for a number of services. Uh, and of course, is they, they can be much more than that. And they can even be more than that. This is one of the worries of libraries is a so-called mission creep, right? How many how many services are there that you can accomplish with quality and responsiveness and not be overwhelmed, which is always a challenge for libraries. Some people would like this, you know, let's just let's just do one or two things and, and call it a day. Well, we're kind of in this uh, this group here. This looks like a manageable metaphor for a number of services leading one of which, and this is this is just our kind of off the top of the head list of things that libraries do, can do, will do, are expected to do. Information, of course, which covers a lot of ground. Communications for, for everyone who is not connected to the internet, the library is like the last resort. Uh, space, physical space. This is, you know, beyond the digital area, uh, but is an actual major contribution that libraries have is just a space for people to go in to save comfortable, uh, conducive to uh, learning and exploring, uh, being a, a, a place to be explore uh, uh, emerging technologies, a, 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 like a lab for the community to, to test, explore, and, and examine new technologies, especially like AI today, which is just huge. The, the the human face of e-government is uh, something that we've long recognized libraries as being. There's so many people that uh, need government services, like all of us, 
uh, and many uh, are daunted by the fact that many increasingly more government public services, taxpayer provided services at every level of government are online and some only online. Well, who are those for, Mr. and Ms. Government? Well, they're for people that are connected. What about the people that are not connected? Oh, well, they can go to the library. Great, thank you. Well, did you transfer any of your savings to the library to take on this additional load? Well, no, we didn't. Why not? Well, we didn't have to. <laughs> okay. Well, nevertheless, this is really important and a growing service for libraries. Health, uh, uh, an emerging role. We just saw today that Arkansas and Oklahoma, the states are implementing uh, 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 new uh, telehealth uh, training, statewide telehealth training for the libraries because more clinics close. There's more difficult access health services. Health information services is a major part of what health uh, is about. And so increasingly libraries are being asked to take on the role of, of front end health uh, access providers. Well, it's, it's a great uh, uh, a great service, uh, but it requires some things, you know, a, a private space to, to do that, the technology set up. And, uh, and it's a real opportunity Sorry about that. I don't know what that was. It's, it is. I'm going to finish up here real quick. Uh, listing, you know, kind of the Swiss Army knife metaphor here, uh, education. Uh, uh, it's an integral part of the education infrastructure. Uh, social services of all kinds, uh, housing, uh, there is, I need to put that in play. Resilience. This is, this is huge uh, in a time of increasing challenges from extreme weather. If libraries, libraries are people, places that people just simply go when there's a disaster, when there's a lights out, Communication is out. How do I how do I find out what's happening? Just you go to the library. Uh, you just think of it. Well, that's a place to normally people find out about stuff because I don't have a radio and my internet is out. The cell system is overloaded if it's still up. What people want in a in a major disaster is communication. That's the first thing they want. They want to know where everybody is. Everybody okay? That's so important, right? You just think about it. And then after very soon after that, they want electricity to charge their, their devices and so on. Then it gets down to material things. Libraries act as uh, uh, clearing houses for materials. It's it's increasingly important role for libraries, like it or not. Uh, last one we're gonna mention here is culture. And that's, that's where things get more fun and a really interesting way to build community that occurs to us is to have cultural activities in the library, you know, musical events, the jazz, the classical music, you know, sort of cool media that uh, that can help people kind of meet each other and, you know, make friends in the community. Technology has isolated us. We're, we're all, you know, we're no longer really attached to the economic welfare of our neighbors like we were in the past. Now it's just, 
you know, I do business globally and who knows what I do here and working from home. Uh, okay, enough of me and time to uh, welcome our speaker, Patrick P.C. Sweeney from the Every Library Institute. Welcome, Patrick. Sorry, everyone, for the delay, but uh, Patrick, take it away. Please introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us how you came to to be the political director for for uh, for uh, 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 libraries. Every library. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Don. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, everybody can see my screen. Okay, I believe. That's um, fine. Yeah. So uh, I am Patrick Sweeney. I go by PC Sweeney on the internet. So. Uh, if you have questions for me afterwards, you can just Google PC Sweeney and you're sure to find me. Um, the reason for that is because there's a million Patrick Sweeney's on the internet and there's only two PC Sweeney's and uh, one of them is a police dog in the UK. So I'm not that one, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so in 2012, we founded Every Library with John Kraska and a woman named Erica Finley. Um I've been around since the very beginning. Um, I came on early as political director in 2014, full time. Um, since then, we've expanded. Uh, we have uh, eight other staff members now and uh, somebody else's political director. So I've taken on the role of digital director. Um, I am also deputy director of the Every Library Institute, which is our 501c3. Um, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. I do want to say that I am not here to sell you on anything around every library. Everything that we do for libraries is done pro bono. So if you need help, if you need assistance um, with any political issue that you're facing uh, at the local, state, or federal level, we would love to help you. Um, we have a, a, a significant number of tools and resources that can help you, including uh, direct and indirect funding. Uh, Fund Libraries, which is a crowdfunding platform, Fight for the First, which is a petition and community organizing platform, um, and a bunch more things that I'll talk about as we go through this. So please feel free to reach out. Um, you can always email me at patrick.sweeney at everylibrary.org. Um, so I'm very easy to find. You can also find that information from our website, uh, everylibrary.org. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Every Library. Uh, we are a 501c4. We were founded in 2012 um, in response to the uh, uh, what happened during the recession, which was the rise of the any tax is a bad tax movement. Uh, we saw the tea, rise of the Tea Party, Libertarian movement, a number of offshoots, small groups um, rise out of that recession. Um, and they took started to take aim at libraries in an interesting way. Pre-2008, libraries could generally put something on the ballot, walk away from it, and it would pass. It'd be fine. Um, Post-2008, we saw the Koch brothers spending thousands and thousands of dollars to tank library ballot initiatives. Um, we saw a number of activists um, from the Tea Party fighting against library ballot initiatives, not because they're against libraries, but because they're against tax-funded government organizations, and that's what libraries are. Um, libraries are also an easy target. That's why they're coming after them. What we realized is that libraries... As an industry, we know very little about the politics of funding libraries. Um, we track ballot initiatives every year, uh, you know, and and what we found is, you know, less than ten percent of library ballot initiatives even file a ballot committee um, with the state, which allows them to raise and expend money on vote yes materials, um, which is the only way that you can raise and expend money on vote yes materials for libraries. So very few libraries even do a campaign at all. Um, we just don't have that in our DNA or in our culture as an industry. So that's why we were created to help libraries understand how to navigate that. Since then, um, we have supported libraries locally, state and federally uh, on uh, legislative issues. Um, and also uh, right now, of course, our lives are being taken over by book bans and those kinds of attacks on, on librarianship and uh, what we're going to see in the next four years, I think. Again, all the support that we're providing, all of the, the funding that we provide directly and indirectly to all these local campaigns and initiatives um, and all the other resources are all done pro bono. Um, you know, we're not selling anything. Um, we're here to support you. What's nice about us not selling anything to you 
is that that means that we are not your client. Um, we don't have to uh, tell you what you want to hear to keep you as a client. We can tell you what you need to hear. Um, and, and sometimes those are tough conversations. Um, and if we're being paid, sometimes that sullies those, you know, an organization's ability to tell you what you need to hear. Um, they're afraid to lose you as a client. Uh, but in the library ecosystem, you know, the bigger ecosystem, um, we are not in competition with your state associations, national associations. We are organized as a 501c4 organization, which allows us to act very different politically. It allows us to use data differently. It allows us to use money differently. It allows us to do a number of different things. Um, you know, great organizations like the American Library Association do very good stuff that is very profession facing. They do great work. You know, I'm an emerging leader. Uh, I, I, I served on a number of ALA uh, committees as well as ALA council. Um, uh, but we are a different kind of organization. In no way do we compete with uh, the ALA. Um, there's also other organizations like Urban Librarians Unite that are advocacy organizations. And we partner with those kinds of organizations to help support their work as much as we can. So Florida Freedom to Read, Texas Freedom to Read, Alabama, uh, uh, you know, we, we provide their website, we provide data, we provide funding, we provide training, we provide networks and a lot of things to these kinds of organizations in order to help them succeed, you know, to build a, to build a, a, a better ecosystem. Uh, so I think the first thing we need to understand here is where does library funding come from? Um, and this is the wildest part to me because this was never taught to me in library school. 90% um, of library funding comes from local taxes. Um, that means local voters and local legislators are making decisions about funding libraries, which means 90% of local library funding uh, is political in nature, whether we want it to be or not. Um, we also have like three to 5% of federal funding um, uh, comes from the feds, three to five comes from the state. Again, those are decisions made by voters and legislators. Um, and so 98% uh, of library funding is political in nature. And we have to be very aware of that when we're doing our work. Um, you know, we don't, we aren't taught this aspect of it. We aren't taught how to be political in library school in a way that addresses issues around library funding. Um, there's a bunch of different reasons for that I won't go into, but um, before every library's existence, there were only four publications a year, like articles, blog posts, whatever, on the politics of funding libraries. However, there were dozens of articles written every year on philanthropic funding for library libraries, which only accounts for around 2% of library funding. We aren't addressing the biggest piece of this puzzle, which is how do we fund our libraries through the through the politics uh, 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 that we have that fund libraries, right? The political uh, uh, ecosystem that funds libraries. And in fact, it, what terrifies me quite a bit is that um, we have only looked at the politics of funding libraries twice in this country um, in the hundred years of libraries existence and, and being in this political model. I um, mean, if you haven't looked at these studies, they're called from awareness to funding, they're from OCLC. Um, and they ran it in 2008 and 2018, making it not only the first time that we've looked at political funding for libraries, but also the first longitudinal study around political funding for libraries. Um, and the data is very useful, and I'm going to get into a little bit right now. If you see me present before, I always talk about this because, you know, I don't care what you call your reference desk. I don't care what you call, you know, uh, your children's programs. I don't care what children's programs you do or what books or whatever you have on the shelves. Um, you know, I think that the one thing that we need to be talking about more than anything else is this data right here. And so I always, uh, I always talk about this data. So in 2008, OCLC found that 37% of Americans would definitely vote yes for libraries. 37% would likely to vote yes to vote for libraries. And 26% were probably going to vote against libraries, which is, you know, pretty solid statistics in 2008. That doesn't mean that 74% of Americans would vote for libraries. That means that, you know, we have that middle 37% that need to be convinced. They need to have their questions answered. Um, and then they would be, then they would uh, likely vote yes for libraries. Now watch what happens though in 2018, 10 years later, and we lost 10% of our definitely vote yes uh, 
voters. We lost 6% of our likely to vote yes voters. And we were up to 42% of voters who are likely or definitely going to vote against libraries. This is especially devastating in states where you need a super majority to pass a tax initiative. Um, but this is, of course, old data now. We'll, we'll talk about that too in just a minute. But let's dive in a little bit more. Uh, you know, we have a group of super supporters um, that green line, these are the people who love libraries more than anything else. You know, this is like single issue kind of voter people. These are the people who volunteer. These are people who donate. These are the people who take action on our behalf. Um, in 2008, they made up 7.1% of the population. In 2018, 6.5, so we lost some. Um, however, uh, you know, that's within the margin of error of the study. I do believe it dropped. I don't know how much, but somewhere, you know, around that. Um, what I think is interesting is that they were 16% less likely to vote for libraries. They used libraries as much as they did before, and they rated libraries as positively as they did before, or they rated libraries more positively than they before, and they rated librarians more positively than they did before, but they were less likely to vote for them. And that's largely because when we talk about voting for libraries, it's a different conversation than whether or not you like them. Um, I can't tell you how many campaigns I've worked on where I've spoken to people using the library who told me that they were going to vote against it, not because they're against the library, but because they're against taxes and they don't trust the government. And that's a different conversation than whether or not you like the library, just fundamentally is. Um, they believe that libraries should exist. They just believe Jeff Bezos should pay for them. You know, that's it. Um, and so when, if we're talking about how do we fund our libraries, we got to start thinking about how do we have these different kinds of conversations. What this study also found is that what does matter, um, what influences people to take action on behalf of libraries positively, are people's belief in their relationship to their librarian, um, the people who work in the libraries. And in fact, uh, you know, when we did a research project on understanding libraries that were going to the voters, what we found is that uh, libraries that had more professional librarians were far more likely to succeed at the polls than libraries that had less professional librarians on staff, which I think is very interesting. Um, what this means, though, is that if 98% of library funding is political and the biggest influence on that politics is you as the librarian, and, what it, and let me back up on when I say librarian in, in most of this context, what I mean is everybody who the public thinks is a librarian, which is the pages, you know, uh, friends groups even, volunteers, you know, a lot of people uh, that the public believe are librarians. So what does this mean though? It means that if we want to in, ensure that our institutions are funded, it means that we have to behave as candidates. We are candidates for our job, whether or not we wanna be. Um, we have to act politically, we have to understand politics, we have to understand the political universe, we have to understand ballot initiatives, which means we have to understand elections, we have to understand legislation. You know, we are political candidates. Um, and that's what we need to understand. Now, the big problem, of course, that we're seeing now is that the data that I shared with you is six years old. <clears throat> we haven't run it again. OCLC doesn't have plans to run it again. Um, we have no idea. That data came, uh, uh, the 2018 data being 16, six years old means that, well, it's, it's pre-book ban movement. It's pre-calling librarians groomers and pedophiles. It's pre, like, you know, libs of TikTok posting about us on, on social media. You know, it's, it's pre all of those kinds of things. We have no idea what the data is right now. We have no idea what voter turnout is going to be for libraries. We simply don't know, um, which is, again, terrifying when 90% of library funding is dependent on local voters. The other thing about this data is that it's the wrong data. Um, all of the data that they had was very, very interesting, um, but it did not allow us to get the data that we need to make it useful. And to get the data that we need to make it useful, what we're talking about is voter modeling. Um, right now, we have no idea who supports libraries. We have no idea why they support libraries. We have no idea what messages used to engage with Americans to get them to support libraries. We have no idea what mediums to send those messages to our supporters through. Um, and that should be terrifying to everybody. Right now, um, you know, we are in a place that I think is very precarious without this data because the people who do have data like this are the people against us. Um, the people who do have hundreds of data points on every single American voter are the people who are against libraries. Um, and we have to really understand that. Um, I don't know if 
uh, uh, grandparents are likely to vote for libraries. I don't know if parents are likely to vote for libraries. I don't know if single uh, uh, parents are likely to vote for libraries. Homeowners, renters, you know, uh, I have no idea. I don't know if it's people who drive a blue Subaru or a red Toyota. Like, I have no clue, um, which makes it very difficult um, to talk to those people. Um, when we look at things like political campaigns, presidential campaigns, they have typically somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 separate and distinct audiences that they understand well enough to send them which messages engage with them, the medium that they engage with those messages through, you know, all these other data points. We have none of that. Um, we have no idea who supports libraries, and we don't know why they support libraries. It's, that data has never been done. Um, I do want to say as we go into this, libraries are not neutral. We do stand for things. We do have the Library Bill of Rights. Uh, we do have freedom of information. We do typically stand for First Amendment rights. Um, all of those things are being pulled into the culture war, whether we like it or not, which means we aren't neutral because we do have things that we stand for. Um, uh, libraries are political because, well, 98% of library funding is political. It doesn't matter whether or not we don't, we, we don't believe that libraries stand for something. Uh, we are political because that is the nature of our existence, whether or not we like it. <clears throat> um, but libraries are nonpartisan. And what I see uh, oftentimes is that people conflate uh, political with partisan. Um, libraries are nonpartisan. Uh, what we saw in the data is that the moderate majority of Americans on the uh, on the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats, were just as likely to vote for libraries or against libraries at the same rate. It's when you get those people at the edges, the really loud ones that we hear about, uh, that things start to get wonky, right? But for the moderate majority of Americans, they're just as likely to vote for or against libraries, which means we are nonpartisan. And I do believe that we should be nonpartisan as government organizations. Um, we also don't take positions on candidates. Uh, you know, we don't tell people how to vote, you know, those kinds of things. Um, now, if we're talking about how do we get political and how do we how do we navigate a political environment? First thing we need to understand is that political activists have three resources and only three resources. And when you start thinking about advocacy in a equation of three resources, time, money and people, what that basically means that if you are doing good advocacy, you are spending one and getting some one of the other ones. If we are spending time working with individuals, cultivating relationships, you know, for funding ask for donations, we're getting money. You know, um, if we're spending money, we should be identifying supporters. I'm going to dive into more of what this means. Um, but once you start understanding advocacy is, is this equation. And this isn't, by the way, uh, all the political stuff that I'm going to talk about. I'm not smart enough to have invented. This isn't these aren't really my ideas. Um, we go to conferences on the very far left. We go to conferences on the very far right, largely so you don't have to. Um, and this is what they do in these trainings. Um, we've done a number of trainings uh, with a number of organizations on how they build political power and influence for their organizations, for their causes, for their campaigns. And every single time we talk about time, money, and people, and how do we expend those things efficiently and effectively um, in order to build political power and influence for libraries. Um, when we're talking about political power and influence, you know, what influences politics? Well, it's money and people. It doesn't matter if you're in, you know, Hong Kong, the UK, United States, doesn't matter. What influences politics is money and people. If you don't have one of those two things on your side, uh, you do not have political power and influence, which means that you cannot put forward a political agenda that's favorable to your cause um, if you don't have one of those two things. For example, you know, when we look at organizations like the NRA, and the NRA has both money and people, uh, but when you look at organizations like the NRA, um, and I use the NRA as, as an example because everybody, I think, knows who they are. Uh, the reason we can't have a conversation about Second Amendment rights in this country is because the NRA can immediately email a million voters in the legislator's district and say, this is what this legislator thinks about your rights to own guns, right? And that incentivizes that legislator to make decisions that are favorable to the NRA's agenda, right? It's basic incentives. It's super easy to understand. That's political power through people. And that's just one example, okay? Uh, we also have uh, political power through money. Um, there's an organization called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, who uses corporate uh, money to lobby for corporate interests 
They don't have people on their side because the majority of Americans would not be in favor of the things that Cal that Alec um, is doing um, and the legislation that they're putting forward. But there are a number of ways to influence legislators through money, campaign contributions and private sector jobs. You know, it's all in this chart right here. Um, uh, you know, they they are able to ensure that uh, or help legislators get elected who are favorable to their cause. This is this is uh, a political power and influence through money, right? So once they have those legislators in place, they can bring model legislation. They can give those legislators, uh, the legislator writes their name at the top of that legislation, put it before Congress. They vote on it. That's how a bill becomes a law, right? And that's that is that is a political power through money. Uh, now, unfortunately, libraries are unarmed against these attacks. Uh, we are completely unarmed against these attacks. Um, because what do libraries have? Well, you know, we're up to 42, we were up to 42% of Americans were unlikely to vote for libraries in 2018, six years ago, free attack. So we are out of time. Um, this is the ticking, this is like the, 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 uh, I forgot what it's called, but the, the doomsday clock of librarianship. Okay, when that when that 42% gets above 50% aver average nationally, we are going to see libraries fail at the ballot at unprecedented levels. Once that happens, why would legislators stick up for libraries to fund them if voters don't stick up for libraries to fund them? Um, so we're gonna lose uh, state money and federal money once we lose local voter support for libraries. And that's already, that was up to 42% in 2018. We have no idea where it is now. I'm guessing it's higher because of all the recent attacks and what I'm seeing people posting on social media and stuff like that. But again, I don't have data. Um, libraries don't have money. Uh, we don't have NRA level money or ALEC level money to fight against these attacks. And we don't have people. Um, every library is working on changing that. As a 501c4, we can work with money and people um, in a very specific way. Um, so we are building the, the nation's largest first and only national voter file of library supporters. Um, we have almost a half a million Americans that we've identified as library supporters. If you work with us on local campaigns and elections like ballot initiatives, we are able to hand you a group of supporters that we've identified in your community from our voter file who will help you volunteer, who have identified themselves as volunteers, as donors, as supporters. You can check them off in your, in the, in your, your local voter file, things like that. Um, so this is the big thing that every library is working on, is building political power and influence through people, because we know that's what we can get. Um, we know that the majority of Americans are still favorable to libraries. Uh, we know that um, all we have to do is identify them, and we identify them through dozens and dozens of different tools from petitions, polls, surveys, pledges, events, you know, local campaigns, elections, legislative actions, you know, all the tools, like we are, we are working to identify these supporters. Um, we know we can get them. Unfortunately, what we've seen historically with library advocacy um, is that if we just say nice things about libraries, some miracle will occur and then libraries will be funded. And this has been the narrative in libraries for so long through so many of our advocacy projects that are just like, it's, an, it's a poster on the wall that says a really nice thing about a library, right? Um, and that's fine, that's great, whatever. Somebody feels nicer about libraries, but that's not a conversation about taxes. That's not a conversation about government, but even worse, uh, what do we do if, uh, what does that person do if they agree with that, right? Um, and so, you know, if you put up a poster uh, that says, you know, whatever, support your local library or whatever, um, above the drinking fountain in your library, because that's what we've been taught is advocacy or on bar coasters in your bar or, you know, whatever in, in your local bars or whatever it is. Uh, you know, if somebody looks at that and they agree with it, well, what do they do next? Right. There's no, there's no, okay. You believe in this sign this petition, volunteer here, click to donate here, sign this pledge do this next step. This is how you get involved. There's none of that in any of our library advocacy. Um, it is all very, very one directional. It's all, let's, let's tell people nice things about libraries. So magic will happen and then our libraries will be funded. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not the way um, politics actually works, right? Um, we have things called CTAs, which are calls to action. 
um, you know, when we when we put up something, if we are spending money, and this goes back to that equation, time, money, and people, if we are spending money on putting up posters, uh, we always ask for something back through a call to action. That call to action can be sign this petition, take this pledge, make this donation, attend this event, volunteer here, you know, whatever it is that we've identified as the tool for moving those people. So we've built a tool called uh, Fight for the First that gives the power to your communities to be able to do that, fightforthefirst.org, um, where if you are facing uh, uh, actions against your library, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we we want to give your community the tools to fight back. The, the community members in the, that that live around you, the tools that they need to push back against those attacks, right? Um, what we found in this book ban crisis, we were getting so many people asking for support that we couldn't. Uh, we were the bottleneck by putting the petitions up on our um, action.everylibrary.org platform, and so we wanted to give the tools to everybody locally. So what we do is we, if somebody puts up a petition on fight for the first. Um, we will contact them uh, and walk them through the process and what it looks like to run a campaign to support the local library. We'll spend up to $1,000 on digital ads to help them get their petition signed. We'll email everybody in our voter file who is local to them to get them to help sign that petition, take action, or engage. Um, and we work with that, that, that local uh, community member um, uh, who, is now who is now a community organizer uh, so everybody who signs that petition, um, remember a petition isn't the first thing, isn't the last thing in a campaign, it's the first thing in a campaign. You put up a petition so that you can identify supporters. That's your call to action. Now those people have, like at Huntington Beach, they have over 6,000 people in Huntington Beach that they can call on um, in order to engage them to show up at board meetings, to show up at city council meetings, um, to uh, vote for libraries. Um, to uh, uh, vote for candidates who support libraries. They now have that political power locally that we've built for them. And they can do it all through the Fight for the First platform. They can organize events. They can put together community groups, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, uh, which is the stuff that every library does, but now we've given it to your communities to be able to do it. Um, every library, for example, can't tell people who to vote for. Like we won't tell people to vote for certain candidates. It's just not within... Uh, the work that we do. However, somebody who organizes locally uh, can. So somebody who puts a petition up on Fight for the First, they identify 5,000 people in their community who support libraries, they can send that, that group an email that says, hey, vote for this legislator, vote for this board member, vote for this city council member. <clears throat> or even better is that we get these people to run. Because the only long-term solution to this is that we put legislators in office who care about libraries, who support libraries, who vote for libraries. And the only way we can do that is if we get our communities the tools they need to run. Fight for the first is the first step in being able to do that, um, as well as our national database and our fundraising and the funding that we offer to these, these local communities. So this is a full system. This is what we're doing for local communities. Um, and just so you know, I'm not making any of this up. This is out of the OCLC Awareness to Funding Study. Um, they had this call out, which is what we should be doing, uh, cultivate and empower super supporters. However, I added the word identify because we haven't identified them yet. And we need to identify who they are if we want to cultivate and empower them, right? Um, so uh, that is from that. But what's interesting is you don't need to uh, identify, cultivate and empower the entire community. In fact, uh, Erica Chenoweth, who is a researcher out of Harvard, found that actions that engage a threshold of just 3.5% of the population have never failed to bring about change. So if you wanna bring about change in your community, you don't need everybody on your side. You don't even need the majority of Americans on your side. You need just 3.5% of the population to do it. Um, and that's what we're here to help you get. Um, that's what we're here to help you achieve. Um, so I really wanna reiterate this, like our strategy around how do we build funding for libraries? How do we build a pro-library funding environment is we identify supporters. It's not identify users. It's not raising awareness. It's not getting more people to use the libraries. It is getting people to support libraries. Um, and that's an interesting distinction because there's a difference between a library user and a library supporter. Uh, a library user, what they found in the OCLC study is that uh, users and non-users were just as likely to vote for or against the library at exactly the same rate. Library use 
didn't even correlate to library support. Um, and, and in fact, at a lot of our local polling, when we're look, working with local ballot initiatives, finds the exact same thing. <clears throat> and in fact, what we find it over and over again is that the only time that library use correlates to library support is if somebody uses the library more than once every two weeks. And if they use the library more than once every two weeks or as a super user, they are 2% more likely to vote for the library. So that's it, 2% more likely to vote for libraries. So we've had this strategy in librarianship too that like, well, if we just get people to use libraries, some magic will happen and then libraries will be funded. And again, there's no correlation between library use and library support. But what is interesting is that if we're shooting for library support, if we're getting people to support libraries, so the people who have a propensity and a need to use the library will become library users on their way to becoming library supporters. So by shooting for library supporters, you will get more users, you will get more supporters, and you will drive more funding, right? Um, getting more supporters specifically means that you know who they are. You have their name and their email address, at least. Preferably you have their name, email address, phone number, and address so that we can communicate them with them through a number of different channels. Um, <clears throat> of course, all opt-in. I'm not asking you to steal data. I'm not asking you to be Cambridge Analytica. I'm asking you to work with us. We'll help you identify who your supporters are. Um, and in fact, uh, this is a famous quote from Archimedes who said, give me a large enough email list and a platform to send them from and I shall move the world. Um, what this essentially means is that, you know, you if you have a large enough email list in your community, you can drive action, you can drive engagement, you can drive people to board meetings, uh, to school meetings, you can, you can uh, drive people to support state legislation, you can drive people to donate, you can drive people to uh, uh, vote for legislators who care about libraries, like the email list is the thing. So if you don't, if you take anything away from this entire presentation at all, it's build an email list of supporters, not just users, library supporters. And if you don't know how to do that, I'm going to really briefly go over it. However, uh, you can reach out to me again, and I can walk you through the process, and we can work together to help you do that. Um, I do want to say there's four kinds of supporters, just to give you uh, some things to think about as you're, as you're working through this. Um, relational supporters are people who you know. They're your friends, your family, your colleagues, your neighbors, or people who you know personally um, that you have relationships with. Relational supporters are the most important. They're the first people who donate. They're the first people who uh, volunteer. They're the first people who sign petitions. They're the first people who show up at board meetings. Get to know your community. Again, library supporters, uh, the thing that influences library supporters most is their belief in their relationship to the librarian. This just proves this. You can look up four kinds of supporters. Um, uh, there's a bunch of, of uh, research and studies around this kind of stuff. Um, then you have ideological supporters. Ideological supporters are people who you don't know but believe in what who you are and what you do. Um, there are aversion supporters. We are gonna we are in a time right now where we are gonna get aversion supporters like we've never gotten before. Um, uh, aversion supporters are people who, uh, you know, they voted for Trump because they were against uh, Kamala. They voted for Kamala because they were against Trump, not because they were necessarily in favor of of either candidate, right? Um, what we typically see and what we saw from 2016 to 2020 um, is what we call like the Trump bump. Um, people gave to progressive causes at huge rates. Um, people donated to every library at huge rates, signed petitions at huge rates because Trump had been coming out against library funding through the IMLS. He was trying to cut federal funding for libraries. Also, this is one of the only times in American history where libraries have been so prominent in the public discourse around you know, what's happening in the country. Um, uh, this is the first time that people have cared this much about libraries and talked this much about libraries, which gives us an opportunity to engage with the public in new ways to identify them, to raise money, to get the resources and tools we need in order to win. Um, access supporters, we don't have access supporters. Access supporters are like, you know, you gave to Obama's campaign because you wanted access to Obama, you know. Um, uh, Elon Musk, donating 75 million to Trump's campaign because he wanted access to Trump. Um, and now there he is uh, in the Department of Government Efficiency, which somehow has two uh, people at the head of it, which seems really inefficient. Um, it's my own personal take on it, whatever. Um, so you have these four different kinds of supporters um, and that's kind of how you think of them. And that's kind of how you think about engaging them. 
if you blow up a political campaign from beginning to end, this is what it looks like. It's a ladder of engagement. I blew it up into an audience engagement roadmap that takes you through the process. You know, you start with data to a target and identify an audience. Um, you can do that through Facebook, through polling, through surveys, through uh, third-party data sources like Axiom to build that initial audience data set. They are unaware of you uh, or what you want to talk to them about. You educate them through story, statistics, email, social media. So all those posters, all that stuff that's like says really nice stuff about libraries, don't throw it away. You have this is your opportunity for that education contact, but that gets them to aware, right? Once you have them at aware, you need to identify them. And identifying them can be as easy as putting a sticker on those posters that say sign this petition, sign this pledge, sign up for our email list. Um, uh, that allows you to identify them so that they become observers. Once they're observers, uh, you want to get to know them so that you can target them with messaging that is uh, relevant to them. So surveys, polls, third-party data, um, that gets you that enhanced list of identified supporters. Then you can start targeting them with custom messaging, A-B testing, problem agitation solution, 2793 messaging. <laughs> Excuse me. All of those things that help you engage with uh, uh, your supporters in a way to create a, an audience of radicalized supporters. The thing is that the only people who are radicalized about a cause are the ones who are going to take action. The reason that that political rhetoric from both the left and the right is so radical is because they're trying to engage with radicalized supporters because radicalized supporters sign petitions, show up to meetings, make donations. If you're like whales, give or take whales, you're not going to get on the boat and go save the whales, right? You aren't going to donate $1,000 to save the whales if you're just like, man, whales are fine, you know? But if you're like, absolutely, I love whales, whales are my thing, you'll probably get on the boat. You'll probably give $100 to that cause, you know? Um, and that's why that rhetoric is, is the way it is. Uh, then you want to help people self-ID, yard signs, bumper stickers, social media badges, those kinds of things. Once people self-identify with a cause, they become uh, adherent to that cause. You can't take a Trump hat off a Trump supporter. They have, se they have self ID before God, country, friends, and family that they are Trump supporters. That is who they identify as. That's what they are about. Um, and there's no way to get that hat off of them. Or it's very, very difficult and very costly to get that hat off them. Um, and so things like yard signs, bumper stickers, social media badges, um, you know, all those kinds of things are really effective tools to do that. Your self-ID supporters are the ones who are going to do those largest tasks. They're the ones who are going to take the biggest actions for you. Um, so that's through this process. Um, you can learn more. We have tons of webinars on demand. I didn't even get into everything that we can talk about. I didn't get into specifics around book banning. Um, I didn't get into specifics around message creating, around fundraising, around digital media, traditional media, earned media, paid media. Like there's so many different things to learn about within this space. Um, if you want to learn about them, we have hundreds of webinars available at everylibraryinstitute.org. We have free ones, but we also have paid ones um, that are available for a donation of any amount. So if you donate, if you can only donate a dollar, donate a dollar, you get access to the to the webinar. Um, the reason that is because we paid people to present that that stuff, um, you know, and uh, 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 it's high level material. Um, you can also check out our books published by ALA uh, and. Uh, uh, winning Elections and Influencing Politicians for Library Funding and Before the Ballot. Um, there's a library funding bundle that you can use to get those books too. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can also shoot me an email again at patrick.sweeney at everylibrary.org and we can set up a time to talk um, and talk through anything that uh, you might want expanded on here or any answer to questions that you know you didn't get to ask here. So thank you so much, team. I really appreciate it. Wow, Patrick. Uh, fascinating, horrifying, and and stimulating. <laughs> what a circumstance that we're in. Uh, this has never been the case before, as you pointed out. You know, we, we libraries have never been under attack in the U in the U.S. ever, as far as I know. Uh, now they are. I and and I think you make the point. You know, basically they're defenseless. They're <laughs> they've never had to create. Uh, a, a response to uh, antagonists because people have either just been neutral and different or positive about them, but not antagonistic. So this is new. This is serious. Uh, your statistics are alarming and impressive. Um, 
the, the, the first question that comes to mind is who, who is leading here? Is it the library director? This, this government employee uh, is, is mm -hmm. out there being political like this. It seems like there's a limit on that. And then the companion there to is. that is where, where do you, where do you put the function of, of library uh, boards, foundations and mm -hmm. friends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, foundations and friends as 501c3s can do a lot of this work on your behalf. Um, they can do a lot of the hard organizing, a lot of the community organizing. They can raise and expend funding to support you in many, many, many different ways. Um, <clears throat> what we hear a lot of times is, well, you know, our friends group can't be political. And that's fundamentally untrue. Um, uh, if you go to Boulder Advocacy, um, bold, B O L D E R, boulderadvocacy.org, there are partners in a lot in explaining a lot of this to um, 501c3 organizations that we work with. How far can they take it? What can they do? Um, how can they, you know, how far, how far politically can we go? Um, uh, you know, and, and we also need to understand like we're living in a really wild environment where we're seeing nonprofit organizations and especially churches really stretch the limits of what a 501c3 can do and nobody's coming after them um but we keep pulling our punches back a bit and i think i think we need to be a lot bolder as the you know bolder advocacy uh tells us um but that there that's a that's a that's a sub project of a group called nonprofit vote um and if you go to nonprofit vote they also uh, have a lot of great information which is their the lead organization um you know when so is that where you would start with with your existing supporters and and yeah. try to activate that, that you really do have this kind of power and don't be shy yeah. kind of thing yeah absolutely absolutely so you know one of the things that i i i see a lot in in library campaigns and elections is somebody comes to us and they say okay we're going to the voters in a year or two what do we need to do and we say okay who do you know um, and the first thing that a political consultant asks to anybody going to the voters, especially candidates, is who do you know uh, and are you willing to ask them? You know, um, that who do you know question is incredibly important. Um, go, we've gone to so many library, uh, li library directors, library administrators who are like, OK, we're going to the voters. And we're like, Great. Who do you know? And they say, I don't know. And we say, well, you have to know somebody because somebody has to form the ballot committee. Somebody has to form uh, uh, the ballot committee that is allowed to raise and expend money on vote yes materials because you as a government employee aren't allowed to do that. You aren't allowed to tell people how to vote, even though it's for the library. Um, and then what we typically do is we work with the library on an info only campaign and we talk them through, okay, here's what you're legally allowed to do as a government organization. You're allowed to tell people what happens if you vote yes and what happens if you vote no. You aren't allowed to tell them to vote either way, but you're allowed to tell them which one. Um, uh, and then we work with the ballot committee, who is a group of private citizens. And your private citizens can be made up of your library board. Uh, it can be made up of library staff who are working, who are not on the clock. They cannot be, you know, uh, it's easier with non-salaried library employees than it is with salaried library employees because you have that time designation or whatever. Um, and it can be your friends, friend, members of your friends, members of your foundation that can make that ballot committee. And we work with the ballot committee to raise and expend funds, work on voter files, do that kind of work. The same kind of model happens when we are talking about like issues around book banning, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I also believe just personally, having been a library director, a librarian, a school librarian, um, that we have enough on our plates as workers. Like, can we just let librarians teach kids to read? You know, can we just let them do library programs? How can we take a lot of this advocacy off their plates and how can they augment the advocacy that's going on in their community in support of them? Um, and that's really what every library is really interested in doing is relieving this burden from librarians as much as possible. What I need from librarians and library workers is I need you to go out and meet your community. I need you to go out and make friends. I need you to show up at the Moose Lodge. I need, to give, I need you to give talks at uh, uh, the the um, Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club, PTA. I need you to go out and make friends. That's all I need you to do. If you go out and make friends in your community, 
you are going to be better off than 98% of the libraries that we work with going to the voters. I can't tell you how often this is. So like one of the big stories, uh, we worked with a library and uh, we weren't working with them. We were just doing a training in, in Colfax, uh, Washington, which is like middle of nowhere, Washington. There's maybe 4,000 people in this town. Um, and John and I showed up in our suits because we were ready to give a workshop. And we went to have breakfast in the coffee shop. In front of the coffee shop was that group of old men, you know, those 60, 70 year old men and their John Deere hats having coffee in the morning and gossiping. Um, people don't know it, but those are the town gossips more than anybody else in town. Um, not only that, but they hold a lot of power. Like they, they had been born and raised there. They knew each other, their families go back, tied to that land, whatever. Um, when we walked in the door in our suits, it was like one of those, uh, the saloons in the old West films, where like the music stops and everybody turns and looks <laughs> at us. They knew we weren't from there. Um, and, uh, and we went and we walked in and we sat down, um, and we heard them whispering about us in the background, you know, and, uh, they finally got one of their buddies to get up and walk over to us. And he goes, Hey, you guys aren't from around here. Right. And we were like, well, yeah, obviously, you know, and he goes, well, you know, it's, it's a, it's nice to say hi when you walk in. He just started like giving us the business. He's like, you're from the government, aren't you? You know, we don't, this is Trump country. We're not, we don't support the government, whatever. And he really started razzing us. Um, and we're just like, you know, we're here with the library, whatever. Um, and they had generally nice things to say about the library. And so when we got in, we talked to the library director and we said, you know, have you ever gone over and just like bought those guys coffee? You know, have you ever just like sat down with them and, and bought them a round of coffee? And she said, no. Um, so we said, okay, like, we got to test this, like go over and just buy them a round of coffee as the library director and just see what happens. Um, and she wrote us this big, long email back. Um, it's actually in our book um, before the ballot. Um, is it like basically her email to us? Um, but she goes, that was the best piece of advocacy work I've ever done in my life. So many of these people who are anti-government and anti-tax are anti-government, anti-tax, because nobody from the government has ever talked to them before. Nobody has ever showed them enough respect to show up at their table, buy them around a co coffee and listen to them. And so many times, so many problems get solved by just letting people either vent or make them feel listened to, you know, or some combination of both. Um, and she was able to, now, are those guys going to go out and start like voting pro-government? No but they're probably not going to come out against the library. And if you can get people to stop uh, uh, speaking out against you, that's almost as good as getting them to speak yeah. in favor of you, especially if they're okay. in your opposition, you know? Um, right. So that's really what I need librarians to do. Go out and make friends. Right. Uh, stop uh, screen share. Now we like to see you live here and I'm sorry we're running over. Uh, we had some glitching here on the front end because we're where I am. We're in the middle of a uh, bombogen and an atmospheric river at the same time. I've never heard of these terms more than five years ago. It's our reality now, uh, and it's it's disrupted. But uh, we're we're gonna for a little bit. If you have to, you know, time go away. If not, you can stay with us for a few more minutes. Uh, the the I think the. The thing that occurs is, should we be taking action today, whether we have a pending ballot or not? There seems to be, and we want to be building support all the time. And and we're, there's a general change in addition, so we need to make a general response to that. And that's like, mm -hmm. it seems that every library should have some kind of immediate action line to build mm -hmm. support to do out. Just to give a quick example here, a little town, I'm 7,000 people. Uh, two years ago, you know, the, our our tourism industry went away. Budget cuts across the board, 20, 25% for every agency in town. The Friends are run a bookstore, but they don't raise money. They don't ask for money. They just do it the old-fashioned way. They sell books for a dollar, raise mm -hmm. a lot of money. Uh, and, and so they started a you know, a, a fundraising campaign by inviting other people to come in and help raise money for the library. What it wasn't so much money and actually not nothing, but it involved people in speaking for the library and that, that this action of being a volunteer leads to then more, you know, commitment. And so whenever there's a library issue, 
will show up in the boardroom and it doesn't you don't say anything. You just sit in a chair in front of the, the, the council and they go, okay, we get it. You know, this you're it's popular. We don't want to cross these people sitting in the room here. So the is one thing leads to people, the money, the time, they all create the other resources for each other if you can get it just so what what what's what should librarians be doing today? Not when there's a ballot. But today, uh -huh. the same only <laughs> you need something tangible to to get a hold that you can make some progress on, like yeah. immediate. Yeah, I mean, getting people to sign up for your email list, reaching out and building relationships with people in your community, um, uh, identifying donors. Like, I think what a lot of people don't understand, and in fact, what what every library gets a lot of flack for. Uh, there's two things, our petitions and our, and our calls for donations. Um, but we do those things so much because um, uh, they build a relationship between individuals and our organizations. The act of donating to a cause or a campaign solidifies that line of support in a way that not very many other things do. And so whether or not you think that your library needs money, um, whether or not you think your cause or your campaign or your organization or whatever needs money, you should be asking for it because giving people that opportunity to participate, um, giving them the opportunity to build that relationship, giving them that opportunity to feel like they addressed a concern in their community around like literacy or reading or the freedom to read or whatever, uh, endears them to you in a way that not many other things do. So, uh, you know, asking for money is just as important as asking for petition signatures. It's just as important as asking for for uh, uh, people to attend um, uh, uh, meetings or or whatever, you know. Um, and so and so that's a big piece of it. Have your friends, have your foundation raising money right now. Um, have people out in your community raising money. Have people asking for people to sign up for your email list. Um, you know, start understanding your supporters. You can run. Uh, something that the friends or foundations can run is public opinion polling and helping build local voter models. If that's something uh, you want to do, we can one. talk about it. You can build uh, a, a, a set of data around understanding who your supporters are, what messages engage them, um, and start talking to them using those messages to engage them for support, not just use. The other thing is like, you know, there's small things that you can do around your messaging um that are more engaging to build support instead of building use so don't just say that you're having story time talk to the public about why story time is important um you know so many times i see people put up you know something on facebook where it's like story times at 10 o'clock and they're like oh nobody came and it's like well why should they you know you didn't tell them about why so there's things like problem agitation solution um uh forms of messaging where you say the problem is children are illiterate uh, here's how that impacts you directly, these kinds of things. What's the solution? Bring your kids to story time. You're going to get a better response. You're going to get more people coming. You know, so there's just, there's a lot of those kind of messaging structures that you can use uh, to change the way you're talking about the work that you're doing. Um, my big example too is like, if I tell my dad that um, the library connects poor people to government services, he's going to go ballistic. Um, you know, but if I tell my dad that the library helps poor people pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get back to work, he's all on board. Either way I say that doesn't change the work that I do in the library. I probably still connect them to government services on their way to pulling themselves out of poverty, to getting better jobs, to, you know, whatever. Um, uh, so understanding like, how are we talking about libraries? Are we using primarily a progressive language to talk about the value of libraries or are we co-opting language on the conservative side? Are we uh, are we segmenting our audiences and targeting them with messages that are effective and resonate with those individuals? You know, and thinking about that, I think, is a lot of the things that you can be doing locally. Um, also, please, please, please work with ALA on your your public policy, on you know your your um, collection development policies. Every library doesn't do that work. ALA, who is a profession-facing organization, is very good at doing that work. Um, please reach out to them on making sure that your policies are sound, um, your meeting room policies are sound, your collection development policies are sound, you know, all those kinds of things so that, you know, you are set up 
infra with your infrastructure properly to uh, keep you from being attacked. <clears throat> One of the other things that I'm, I'll also say, um, I know there's a long answer to your short question, but um, in a lot of states, especially like California, you can set up a general ballot committee. Um, even if you're going to the voters like 10 years from now, you can set up a general ballot committee right now. And your friends or foundation can give money up to the limit of the law. Uh, they can give a contribution to that local ballot committee that you've set up. And they can do it over 10 years. Every year they can give a small donation so that when you actually do go to the voters, the fundraising piece is done. And by far, the hardest part of any ballot initiative is raising the money to run a ballot initiative. If you can take that off, if you can start taking that off your plate right now, you are going to be in such a better spot. So you can you can prepare yourself for these kinds of uh, uh, things that you are going to need in the future. You know, I like that. Uh, I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, let me give one more tip too. Yep. Uh, what we're seeing is a number of organizations that are membership bombing friends and foundation groups in order to take them over. So, um, in Llanos County, Texas. Um, the uh, right-wing activists took over the friends group by becoming members, voting out the board, uh, vo installing their own board, and then uh, giving all, donating all the money to the city in order to fight uh, in favor of book bans. Um, and so you can be stripped of your friends or foundation, get your bylaws in order so that things like that can't happen. Just get it in order right now. Wow. Other one, I had not thought of that one, but I'm not surprised. We've seen the school boards level time now. Um, mm -hmm. We're, we're going to open it up. I wanted to ask uh, Diane Connery, who's been through this uh, sort of process, to give her, her experience about how she's uh, dealt with that. Diane, welcome. Tell us quickly what you went through with your board. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic, Patrick. So yes, we are in the midst of this and it's based not on book banning, but all taxes are bad. Um, we felt like we did everything strategically right. We were just incredibly successful as a library. New city manager, new uh, city council members came in and all of a sudden they're talking about eliminating our budget. Um, so we started working with every library. They responded, um, got things going within 24 hours. The only thing that that side project I'm working on to add to Patrick's is the, um, I've, I've thought it might be a good idea for libraries to grow their own city council members. So I'm working on a plan to, um, teach people in our area about local government through you know, civic engagement classes, hoping that eventually that will pay off and some of the people who are library supporters will be running for local office. Very good. I, there's so many heavy lifts. In that. I was imagining a board get uh, that, that uh, start here and all the different move to the end point and um uh, it looks like a complicated really complicated game with people uh basically impossible but can you 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 link these webinars and i'm sure they are illuminating on various aspects of it but it feels like an interactive workshop do you do those a workshop for a lot of libraries at the same time to walk through individual issues you're asking me sir yeah i am yeah yeah absolutely um yeah we do a lot of workshops at library conferences we do them all the time we've done them uh with the De the delaware uh maryland library conference um we always do a pre-con with them that's eight hours in fact um, <clears throat> with like uh, the state of Washington, the state of Nashville, the uh, state of Tennessee, um, and a few others, we've done like traveling training shows where they set up like four locations. We show up, everybody in that region is invited to come do an eight hour day with us where we go through beginning to end. How do we advocate for libraries? And we go to the next spot in the state, next spot in the state, next spot in the state. Um, those kinds of trainings are a fee for service model though, simply because it costs us a lot of money to do those things. Um, 
and also uh you know the money goes it's it's a way that we can raise money for every library and their work so um, well, how, how how about a, a general overview workshop that you can do mm -hmm. online that would then cultivate follow-up one-on-ones and situations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we do have those. Um, and in fact, if you, uh, I'll drop, I'll drop a link in the chat to okay. um, some of those. Good, good, good. I'm sorry, we're so far over here. Uh, there is one interesting question. I'm sorry, Stephen. Uh, 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 do you work with state libraries? Yes, absolutely. Um, quite a bit, actually. We're working with um, a number of states and their state libraries on a wide range of issues. All right. All right. Uh, speaking of state libraries, we've got two coming up. We've got uh, Florida and North Carolina, the State Libraries of Florida and North Carolina coming up next month, talking about libraries responding to the disasters of the hurricanes, which is another point to make for libraries, I would say, in the instances how, they, how they're there in times of need. Um, we're just so far over. I, I, I thank you for staying with us. Uh, and we've lost, you know, like half of everybody because of time, but, uh, I'm going to stop the recording here and then we can, if you have any more time, we can hang out and, but I want to thank you very much for, for this illuminating, frightening and motivating presentation today, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.